Welcome to another study of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be studying from Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 12. Um, if you want to turn in your Bibles there, we'll be getting into it in just a minute. Um, I want to begin by talking about uh, our title this morning, Living Generous. Uh, many times when we think of generosity, uh, at least I do, I think of, I tend to think of someone who gives a lot of money. Maybe it's having gone to different college campuses with teenagers as a youth minister, you'd walk around, you'd see these buildings and they'd have these names of these people because these people would dig, would uh, give enormous amounts of money to have these buildings built um, for the campus. Or, and you think of that person as being a very generous person. Well, I want to take generosity and talk about it with a little bit different twist on it because I think living generous really and gets into more than what we do with our money, but it has to do with the way that we treat people. It has to do with our attitude towards them. In many ways, it has to do with the grace that we show on people. And so um, as we look at this text here, Jesus seems to hop around with some different topics in here, but I really want to tie it together with this thread of generosity and how we're supposed to treat people because I see that going through this whole section here and it and it connects them together in, in just a real special way. So be looking for that as we as we read there. Again, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to go ahead and read this week, as, as I have in earlier lessons, in both the New International Version as well as the Message, because I want, to, I want you to hear that, get that context and understanding of it. So, um, But the first time we read through it here, we'll be reading through Matthew chapter 7, um, 1 through 12, in the New International Version. Whatever version you have, follow along. I um, encourage you, use your Bibles, uh, spend time with the, with the text here. Let's begin. Verse 1. Don't judge, or you too will be judged. For it is in the same way others judged, you'll be judged. And with the same measure you used, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Don't give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives... For the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door is opened. Which of you, if his own son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, you're, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So, in everything... Do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Again, let's read it from the message. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see the smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your face is distorted by contempt? It's the whole traveling road show mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your own part. Wipe the ugly smear off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Don't be flip with the sacred. Banter and silliness give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogan. In trying to be relevant, you're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide and seek game you're in. If your child asks you for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for a fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, 
you wouldn't think of doing such things, do, doing such a thing. You're at least decent in your own, with your own children. So don't you think the father who conceived you in love will do even better? Here it is. Here is a simple th rule of thumb guide to, for behavior. Ask yourself what you want other people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it to them. Add up the law, God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. A lot of things in this text, but I want to break it down into some different sections here so you can kind of see the flow of it here. In the text, first off, in verses 1 and 2, he talks about judging others, and he talks about being generous in our judgment to others. I hope you, you hope you see that in there. He really wants us to be wrapped up in the way that we look at each other, the way that we, well, in some ways we can easily say, well, he says don't judge. But at the same time, within the same text, he, he implies some judgments that take place. How am I going to help someone with it, with, with get the speck out of their eye if I haven't passed a judgment? Or later on in the, te in the text, as he gets into the wide and narrow way, um, he talks, you're having to pass a judgment there. Or the wise men and foolish men, aren't we passing judgment? And so when the way we understand judgment in this isn't just to say, well, I'm passing judgment means... That I look at you and I and I and I call something about say something about you. No, we need to understand that judgment is something that is part of us. What he's talking about is the way that we judge one another and the, and how generous we are towards one another. That I can be so mean to you because I don't even well I'm not even kind about to myself and then I get mean to you as well. Instead, he challenges you the same way I, you judge others. You need to be using that same measure of grace with them. You need to be generous. We need to be generous with our judgment towards others. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Verses 3 through 5, he says, he talks about judging ourselves first. He talks about how, oh, we've got this log in our eye, and he uses some hyperbole here to describe this beam sticking out of my eye when I'm sitting there trying to, to flick the, the sawdust out of your eye. And we would recognize that that's ridiculous. Who would do that? Well, we do sometimes. Instead, we need to be generous. We need to be kind, and we need to look at ourselves. Part of this generosity that we, we deal with in this and gets into looking introspectively towards myself and, and making sure that, that I'm in the right relationship, extending grace to myself and extending generosity to myself too. Verse 6, he, he gets into a verse here, and this verse here throws a lot of commentators, and, they, and it gets difficult because it almost seems like he's flowing differently. N.T. Wright talks about this verse 6 as he talks, and this is the verse, if you look in your Bibles, that talks about don't give, what's, don't give to dogs what's sacred, don't throw pearls to pigs. N.T. Wright talks about how to most Jews in Jesus' day, they would assume that pearls or that pigs and, and, and dogs would have been Gentiles. And in many ways, he's talking about don't well, have realistic expectations. Don't give them something that they're not ready for or that's not an, uh, that's a false expectation for them. N.T. Wright makes the connection that in, up until this point, Jesus is discouraging the gospel being spread to the Jews. Now, later on, the gospel does get spread to the Jews. We look in the book of Acts and we see Peter going out to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 9 and 10. And so that gets to that point. But part of it is the way we judge others and the generosity. We need to approach people with realistic expectations. Then in verses 7 and 8, um, he talks about how God models this generosity. He talks about ask and it'll be given to you. You just ask the Father and what's he going to do? He's going to give you generous, generously. If you seek him, what's he going to do? He's generously going to help you find him. If you knock, what's he going to do? He's not going to hold back. He's going to come to the door and take care of you. And likewise, we need to model this generosity to others. In verses 9 through 11, he uses fathers as a model. Fathers, you're not going to try to trick and be mean to your, your kids. You're going to give them good and generous gifts because that's what fathers do. 
Now, we may be sarcastic and we may be playing jokes, but most good fathers, at least, they model generosity. They try to show loving kindness. They try to do what's best for their children. And then in verse 12, we see um, what we often call the golden rule. He even says this sums up the law and prophet. In many ways, this is what living a generous life is all about. That I treat you not how you deserve, but how I want to be treated. I don't react to you by being mean, but what do I do? I treat you better than you deserve in many ways. And that's what generous living is all about. That really is at the heart of it, that we are showing grace, that we are living like God does. Uh, generosity, I believe, is, a, is an attribute of God, and it's something that we as Christians need to try to model and pursue. But in this text, he's talking so much about treating others with generosity. Now, four key things that I want you to want to bring out, four key points um, in this. Number one, I, th I think the text is teaching us that we need to treat others generously. The way I interact with people, I need to show loving kindness. I need to give them the benefit of the doubt. I need to go beyond and beyond. Too often in our world, we don't. We, we judge people not generously, but we judge them harshly and, and well, we've got to, got to give them what they deserve. Well, let's be honest. Grace is all about not getting what you deserve. And that's the way we're supposed to treat people. Instead of assuming what's wrong with someone, let's, let's try to treat them better than that. Let's try to treat them kind and, and assume that, that they deserve even better than we treat them. Second point that I, I think gets into exactly just that, and that we need to assume the best in others. It's real easy for us to look at other people and go, you know, I don't know. I, and we grow jaded with life. We grow tired and weary, and it's, it's easy to judge harshly people. It's easy for us to look at them and go, you know, I've been burned before, and I don't want to get burned again. And what God calls us to just go beyond that. He calls us to give generously, to love generously. Don't assume the worst for people, but assume the best of people. The third thing I see in this text that I want you to grasp. That generosity starts with a healthy interpersonal viewpoint. He talks in the text about do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Talks in the text about removing the log from your own eye. He's wanting us to, I want to, he, it, it almost comes with this assumption that I'm going to be trying to deal with my own issues and work through my own junk in many ways. And I need to do that because when I do that, then I can be more generous with other people. When I embrace God's grace and really allow him to transform my life, what happens? Well, I can real much more easily be, give them the benefit of the doubt because I know I've needed the benefit of the doubt. I know I need God to help me. I know I'm insufficient. And so being generous to others really is, in many ways, it starts with looking at yourself. The fourth point. I think that it shows us just how powerful generosity is as an attribute of God. That God is not frugal with, gener with his grace. He is very generous with his grace. God isn't holding back. He isn't a spendthrift on the way he treats us. He gives us more than we need. He gives us more than we want in many ways. Now, does he always give what we want when we want? Well, that's not what the text teaches. But what it does teach us is we're, he calls us to give and love generously as he has lived and loved generously for us. Now, let's, I, I want to make sure we keep this practical with us because um, there's, some, there's some really neat things in this text that I think we can, we, can, we can learn. If we're going to be generous with God's grace, it has to do with how I treat people. And sometimes I, by my nature, I can become very sarcastic. Because after time, and, and, and you know what's interesting, the older I get, the more, the more critical I become. I have to be honest about it. And I have to be overcome sometimes some of that jadedness. And I have to sharpen that and file off some of that edge that I've got on me. Because 
well, because I've been burned before and I don't want to be generous. And may, I may have to work on that. I may have to watch my sarcasm and my uh, negative viewpoint on things that I don't become mean-spirited towards other people. That just because one person hurt me doesn't mean all everyone is. And that's how I can become judging. I don't want people to judge me that like that. I want people to give me the benefit of the doubt. And really trying to do, to give people the benefit of the doubt is one of the best applications I think we can have in this. Another one, and I've given it to you in your notes, and, and there's, um, there's, there's an article from a Spiritual Discipline Can Books by Adele Calhoun that talks about the discipline of humility and which we really work at humbling ourselves because when I humble myself, others become lifted up and all that. That when I, I realize that other people are the same as me in need of God's grace, they're in need of people showing them love and kindness. And it really makes a huge difference when I do this. It really does change people's lives, changes my heart, and it changes others. But living humbly can become such a, a powerful discipline. A good friend of mine um, when I lived in Wisconsin was the preacher over in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. His name was Roy Ratcliffe. Um, Roy was, uh, Roy's passed away now, um, but Roy, uh, back in the 90s, Roy had the opportunity. He got a call from a guy who had preached in Milwaukee, Rob McRae, and said, hey, there's a guy that wants to study the Bible to get baptized, and he was up in the prison up in Portage, which is about an hour north of Madison, where Roy was at. Uh, it turned out that that person was Jeffrey Domner. Uh, for many of us that grew up in, in the 90s, and so we, we've heard the stories, and we were familiar, especially those in Milwaukee, it was a huge story about Jeffrey Domner, the serial killer who killed a number of people and, and did horrendous things to them. Well, Domner was being imprisoned up there in Portage um, for a long term. Long, and uh, somehow an, a little lady, Ann Motts, I believe her name was, in Virginia had contacted him. She thought, this person needs grace. This person needs love. And she gave him the benefit of the doubt, and she contacted him. She knew he, was a, he had done horrible things, but don't we, don't we all need God's grace? And so she wrote him and contacted him. Next thing you know, they studied the Bible together. And he, Jeffrey, wanted to get baptized. And so he didn't know how to do it. So one way or another, the, the word got to from, uh, uh, from, from Ann to, to, to Rob, finally to uh, Roy. And I got to talk to Roy on numerous occasions about his, his time with Jeffrey. He said he was an interesting young man. He made him. He he got to. He went to the prison, and he he ended up writing a book. And encourage you if you really want to read an interesting book, his book uh, "Deep Journey, Dark Grace," or "Dark Journey, Deep Grace." Excuse me. Um, great story that um, really looks at the way that we live generous, in spite of and and generous to people who really need it is is really what it's called to do. That, Rob, that, that, that Jeffrey Domner was baptized by Roy Radcliffe. And then about six months later, he was killed in prison. But it really it shows that I, I do unto others as they would, I would have them do unto you. It'd be real easy to look, oh, this is, a, this is a horrible person who deserves... No, we don't give people what they deserve. We give them what we want to be treated. I would, if I were hurting and dying and lost, I would love for someone to rescue me. And Roy, he made himself uncomfortable. He made those journeys. He had some weird conversation. Took a lot of heat, too, because there were some people that really did. They, they struggled with that kind of generosity. And when we look at this whole idea of, of generosity, it's challenging us to live in ways then in some ways is uncomfortable. Because I don't, many times, I don't want to do unto others as, as I would have them do unto you them. I want to do unto them what I think they deserve. I want to pass judgment, and I want it to be harsh and fast. 
And God calls us. He, he says that the law and the prophets, the whole Bible is summed up in treating others the way I want to be treated, which is so powerful And, and when you really grasp that. Encourage you. Go through your notes. If you didn't download them, encourage you to do so. In the notes, you'll find um, there's the, there's not just the scriptures, but there's also um, several other things. Talks about the triad uh, triads in this text, where we look at the 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 traditional righteousness, the sinful pattern, transforming initiative. So you can kind of play with that. There's some discussion questions for you to go with. Uh, to, to ask yourself or ask the person that you're um, studying this with also to try to, to grasp some of these and wrestle with this because judging one another can be a tricky thing and, and uh, we, can, we can have some interesting conversations. Uh, you can have some interesting conversations with the person you're with about that. But then there's also the notes on how do you practically practice the discipline of humility or how do you practically um, really refrain from being sarcastic. And, and work on that. Um, encourage you. If you didn't get a chance to download the notes, um, uh, please do that from the website that you're on. Otherwise, you can always email me at daryl at longmontcoc.org and I'll be happy to send those to you. Um, though there, I can, I'll be glad to email them to you. Living generously and living with generosity in our lives is a challenging thing, but it really is one that can transform our world and transform us. Read through the text, grasp, and um, if, if you don't agree with me, I, I'm okay with that. Read the text and, and study it on your own and, and uh, even tell me, what do you see in this? I'd be happy to have conversations with you about the text. Um, Sermon on the Mount is such a it covers so many things, and I know as we've we've now studied about eleven lessons together with this, um, there's times when I I got to be honest, I'm sore. I'm I'm feeling a little challenged by all this because there's so many things that Jesus gets into that really hit close to heart, and and I, and I hope you're hearing that. I hope you see that. Um, do spend time reading through the Sermon on the Mount. Don't quit just because we're near the end of this. Keep on allowing God's Word to transform your life. Allow His Holy Spirit to stir your heart and draw you into, and, into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Him. Next week, we're going to be looking a little bit farther into the text. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. And so as we get near the end of our study, we've got just a little bit more to go. Read through that. Think about it. Uh, spend more time really grasping some of these this message of Jesus. Thank you for joining me, I, and, I, and I hope this is beneficial to you. Um, it, I know it's beneficial to me, so if no one else gets anything out of this, uh, I can honestly say I'm. it's been a good study for me. Have a great week, and may God bless you.